Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lise Betteridge, and if you haven't already figured it out, I'm the Registrar and CEO at the College. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this second uh, bank. Uh, and this is the live-streamed breakout session, Hashtag Social Work, Informal Use of Information and Communication Technology in Social Work and Social Service Work Practice, led by Dr. Faye Mishnah. A noted author and expert on the topic of bullying and cyberbullying in Canada, Dr. Fabe Mishna is Dean and Professor at the Factor Inwintosh Faculty of Social Work, University of Toronto, and is cross-appointed to the Department of Psych Psychiatry. Faye holds the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Chair in Child and Family. She's conducted research on bullying, cyberbullying, cyber counseling, and the impact of cyber technology in traditional face-to-face -face counseling and interventions with vulnerable children and youth. She has a small private practice in consultation and therapy. As social workers and social service workers, you know that today's information and communication technology is changing every facet of our lives, including areas of practice. That's why I'm so very pleased to introduce Faye, whose work on ICT epitomizes the Ahmed 2019 themes, ethics, insight, and innovation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Faye Mishna. Thank you, Lise. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, because of a bit of a glitch, I'm going to have to be moving mine and that at the same time. So if it doesn't work, let me know. Um, I'm just going to start by asking, how many here use informal inf information and communication technologies in your work with clients? Yeah, so quite a lot. And it's interesting because when we first started this a long time ago, very few were. So what I thought I would do is just briefly review, because um, we've been working on this for quite a while, so I'll briefly review what we've done and then talk about the current study, which some of you might have taken part in because we, we sent a survey out uh, across Canada. So basically, the dig as we all know, the digital age has revel oops. The digital age has revolutionized how individuals of all ages interact. It's absolutely mind-blowing. Um, ICTs have led to transformative changes, not, in our not just in our personal lives, but absolutely in our professional lives. And it's permeated how individuals seek support for a wide range of issues. Um, and the increased use of ICTs presents unique complexities for practitioners. And I think what's important about that is that um, for a while it was, well, then just don't do it. And still there's a lot of uh, recommendations of don't do it because it's problematic. But like in other areas of our life, it's, we can't do that. It, it's so part of our life that it's not helpful. It's interesting, I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago about uh, sexting to a school board. And, parent, and talking about the fact that we can't just tell kids not to do it because they do it. It's not helpful. It's like when I was growing up saying don't drink and drive was not helpful because they're doing it and then they get into trouble. And some of the parents came back up later because I thought they were going to be really mad to hear that. But they said they actually were relieved because when everybody says don't do it, they can't stop it from being done and then they feel responsible and like, you know, inadequate. So I think that's where we are with this. So the impacts. Um, so there's impacts in three distinct ways. And the first is formal online ICTs. I'll briefly describe that. The second is formal blended. And the third is informal. And we call it intercession ICTs. But that's what we're talking about here. So formal ICTs, they're very different. They're standalone ICD interventions, like e-counseling, telepsychiatry. And cyber communication is actually the mode of intervention. And, and it's structured, there's clear protocols, it's secure, um, and it's through designated uh, software. So that's not what we're talking about because that is actually very structured and, uh, as I said, secure. And they are actually an alternative to in-person treatment. And uh, research has shown that online therapeutic interventions are effective and actually as effective as person-to-person. Just keep checking this. 
So the formal blended, now this is also structured, is integrated through, there's face-to-face -face plus plant and structured online elements. So for example, if somebody's being seen face-to-face, -face, they might have planned CBT exercises or some kind of exercises, and that's part of it. And again, they're both monitored and they're both, again, secure. So informal intercession, that's what I'm talking about. So it's where your main form of practice is face-to-face. -face. And it can either, and then ICT is used just informally. Like there's no, nothing planned, there's no encryption. And it can be asynchronous or, in, or synchronous, it can be emailing, texting, social media, it can be anything. Um, but importantly, the primary modality is face-to-face. And the interactions in this, they began as just very practical, and they often begin as practical, like could I change the time to meet? And that's, that's a no-brainer, that's like very easy. But it can move to complex, communicating distress, intense distress, and that can happen pretty quickly. So that, um, that's important, and there's virtually no research on this. And often when there is research done about information and communication technology, they're not separating those three, they're combining them. And that's very important because informal is very different for many reasons. I mean, first of all, that it's not planned. Second of all, it's not secure. Um, so it's really increased since mobiles have become ubiquitous. When I first started doing this research um, with my team, Mary and Bogo, what we found is that uh, it wasn't used much. But then three years later, when we went back, and I'll briefly describe that, everybody had mobiles. And then once the mobiles happened, everybody was doing it. And so really, we talked about it, the creep, because it's really crept into practice. And uh, it wasn't planned. So really, it's, inevit it's an inevitable reality in contemporary practice. And, and sometimes people will say, well, we don't have to do it because it's different from you know, our boundaries. But boundaries have changed in every way of life with doctors, dentists, hair appointments, anything. So entertainment, so for sure it's going to change with social work practice. Um, and, uh, and it can be effective in building wor working relationships, and it can offer continuity. So there are some clear benefits, but we need to look at, um, we need to look at it to understand it. So some of the issues are the ethical, the ethical uncertainty, because ethical issues can come up, and the other is boundary management, unanticipated contact. So I remember in one of our studies, uh, the first studies, one of the people in the focus group said that she was in contact informally with one of her students that she worked with, and on Friday night she got an email saying he was threatening, he was you know, considering suicide. And so what are the choices? Ignore it. Um, it's, it's her private time. So she decided to, to actually call his father and get that sorted out. So those are the kinds of issues that it can bring up, which is very different than the formal. Um, but again, saying just don't do it isn't the answer. Um, and then another point is that uh, I think it's becoming more and more known. At first, uh, the internet was thought to be able to democratize information and everything, and more and more we're realizing that in fact it's not the case. Um, that uh, so there is an equal justice, an equal equi equity and access. So we need to be aware of that, again, as social workers, because that you know, we have it with some, not with others. So that's, that needs to be addressed. Um, and I'm just looking at the research. So there's a lot of research on formal ICTs, and there's a growing research on formal blended. There's almost no research on informal intercession, almost none, and that's important. And it's also important because in, in a recent study we did, practitioners are not talking about it. So I'll ask you guys another question. So of the ones of you that use it, how often do you talk about it with your supervisors or your peers? Right. Yeah, so this exactly fits with our findings. And that's why we need to deal with it, because we can't just say don't do it. People are doing it, but we don't want people to be stuck with it as a problem on their own. 
Um, so we need to understand it. We need to understand the implications, the, the benefits, the negatives, and, and we need to help practitioners know how to deal with it. I'll just move this along. Um, and so it's necessary to understand how and why practitioners use it and to address the ethical, legal, systemic benefits, challenges, and ambiguities, because there's all of those. So there's three frameworks that we found helpful um, to illustrate it. One is the ecological systems framework. The second is the technological assistance acceptance model. And the third is the concept of the working relationship. And each contributes, we feel, to the understanding. And I'll just briefly go through those. The ecological systems framework, which you all know, it incor incorporates the reciprocal contributions of the nested levels of a person's environment. And um, I, I think I don't need to go into that, except to say that more recently, it's been adapted to keep pace with ICTs. So techno subsystems have been proposed in the microsystem. And they're both, it's been done in different ways. One is by having the uh, techno system being placed as um, part of the individual subsystem. And another way has been to place it as the ecosystem around. And um, one of the things that my team and I talked about is, in a, in a way, it kind of is a thread right through. So I think it's not clear how it fits. But what is clear is we need to add that. That is interacting with all aspects. And if we don't add that, we're going to miss that when we meet with clients. We're not going to ask them about it. And we're also not going to be prepared to deal with it when it comes up in our sessions, which it will, because they'll contact us. Um, the technical acceptance model, it basically um, it, un it talks about how the perceived usefulness and the perceived ease of use. So that is what it helps it become accepted. So it really explains whether the benefits of ICTs in practice outweigh the effort. And so 10 years ago when we first started talking about it, the benefits seemed to not outweigh the effort because it was just complex and there were not ICTs. With, IC, with um, mobiles, it's really made it very easily accessible, and it's also accepted. Um, and so that, that's really important. So that's part of societal. So again, it's hard to say to social work, we're different. And then the working relationship. As we know, that's considered central to social work. And uh, there's evidence, a lot of evidence, that it's the most crucial development. And, and so it's really important to understand how it, ICTs actually affect the working relationship. And some research has shown that it has, and you know, that it's provided accessibility, it's provided um, a way to communicate between sessions. So, but there's no research on the informal use in ICT, so we need to look at that. So I'll just briefly go through. We started studying the creep in 2009, and then um, then we continued in 2010 to 13, and then now we have a current study which is funded by SHRC. So from 2009 to 2013, we had 42. Per oh, let me get this going. We had um, 42 participants who were interviewed. 29 females and 13 males, and they, they ranged in ages between, from mid-20s to mid-60s. They had an MSW degree, and they're very diverse areas of practice. And there's just some of the criteria. And the initial conclusions of that were that it really had revolutionized communication. It had dramatically impacted the traditional face-to-face -face sessions. Although I, I must say, the practitioners were not happy with it because they felt it was the clients responding to uh, initiating it, and they didn't know what to do about it, and they did not like it. Um, and, and the elements of practice affected, though, um, were boundaries, time and space, because they'd get messages at different times, disclosure of information, um, therapeutic working relationship was affected, and the ethical legal issues and policies and procedures. So our initial conclusions at that point were that it had not only crept into traditional practice, it actually signified a turning point. 
So the findings of phase one, there were four themes. It was client-driven practice. So basically, as I said before, it was the clients reaching out to the therapists, the social workers, and the social workers didn't like it, didn't know how to handle it, but they were stuck with it, and they didn't have anywhere to talk about. It was the Pandora's box, that um, once you open it up, um, and there's a response, and there's some communication, it's hard to put it back. I had that experience myself with a client where I tried to say, well, let's go back to how it was before. But you can't really go back to how it was before so easily. And also then an ethical gray zone, you know, of, of confidentiality, privacy, those kinds of things. And then permeable boundaries. The boundaries then were less clear. And less set by social workers. I think we have been very used to being the ones to set the boundaries and to follow them. Um, and it was pretty easy to do. So for example, if somebody wanted to contact us after work hours, it would be hard to contact our phone, our home phone, and emails weren't around. But, but email is public, so, so social media. So it, we, can't, we no longer were in control of it. So in the second um, uh, um, iteration of our study, we it changed. We found that the practitioners went from reaction to intentional use. So they had first reacted, and we went back to the same ones. And the reason we did that is because it was three years later, and somebody had recommended to us that we needed to look at younger practitioners at, at, to see if they were different. But when we were doing that, we realized that three years later, things have really changed, so let's go back. Three years later, the practitioners who were very reactive and not happy with it had changed because they had recognized that it was part of the world, but they, they on their own, they didn't have um, advice, they didn't have anywhere to turn, so they came up with their own uh, ways of working. So educate my instincts, shift the times. How is it meaningful to clients? What is this going to mean in terms of the impact on my personal life, in terms of the boundaries? And how can I figure out what works? So, um, so the implications for social work education were that uh, we really needed to reflect on the new context of practice and support both educators and students in navigating and managing the digital world. Because the, the, the result of that was really seeing that, in fact, um, we were not preparing students for this. So that they're, when they graduate and they go into an agency, this is going to happen to them too. And even if they're young, at first people thought, oh, well, they're really young, they're used to, really used to it. Well, they're used to it in their personal lives. They're not used to it in their professional lives. And given that this is what's going to happen, we owe it to them to prepare them for that. Um, So um, we needed to incorporate ICT competencies into the curriculum we need to. And educators, practitioners, and supervisors, and administrators must become knowledgeable and engage in discussions. And it doesn't seem that that's quite yet happening. Um, and so the implications for social work education would be, um, I'm just mentioning some of them, there's benefits, there's blurred boundaries, there's potentials in breaching confidentiality. Um, uh, inappropriate posting, internet arguments, the personal becomes public. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we need to address and I don't think are, have been addressed. And then curriculum, um, how to have formal education structure, student orientations to it, workshops for faculty members, class discussions, and assignments. And, and again, in full curriculum in social work student uh, programs, it's not easy to add that in, but it's critical. And um, I'm just going to move to... Uh... So the conclusion of that second one, where we interviewed uh, the same practitioners three years later, and we also interviewed younger uh, practitioners to see if they had a different view, is that they were beginning... I just want to make sure I'm... 
they were beginning to tailor their own technology and form practices. And so, for example, um, one of the guidelines in the literature is often when you start, tell your clients you will not be available by email or you will not, or if they email you, this is when you respond. But what our practitioners told us is that that doesn't work. I would say that, but then I need to repeat it. I need to continue to go through that and revisit that. So they found ways to make that work. Um, but they, there wasn't guidelines. They had to develop their own. And the, the conclusion is not whether to use it, it's how to use it effectively and responsibly because it's not responsible not to respond. So if a client responds to us, we have to respond somehow. It might not be by email, but we have to deal with it. And the other thing we have to be aware of, people who are very willing to use it have to be aware of web-based uh, services. So for example, Skype. People assume that that's an okay way to um, meet, to contact people. But Skype actually has a term of reference that's saying that uh, they will keep the record, and they have the right to review the record. So, um, so we've just gone from a time where we kept the confidentiality and we could assure it to another way that we can't. We can't because somebody in Skype has got that information. And then again, if we're doing it by email, we also don't have it. So let's say we're working with a vulnerable person, a woman who might be beaten, anybody else who's vulnerable. We can't guarantee who will see it on her or his um, email? And, and, and the, the reason we need to grapple with this is because the answer is not. Like, it's, we've passed the time where we can say, just don't do it. Um, so when we, I think I'm, so some of the experienced and some of the new practitioners, they actually uh, were different and similar. They weren't as different as we had thought they might be. Um, they all agree that it's not feasible to adopt and maintain a policy that prohibits it. Because again, we know what happens when you prohibit it, prohibits it, it goes underground. And, uh, and by creeping into practice, that we have to recognize it's extended boundaries. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be any boundaries, but it means we have to recognize that. And the responsible position is to examine and understand the consequences and implications in order to inform how we go forward. So then, this is the shirt funded study, and it's uh, called the Hashtag Social Work. It's a mixed method study, and there were two phases. The first was an online survey, and we administered it to social workers in Canada and the States, and now US and Israel. Did any of you get that and fill that out? I guess not, okay. Um, and questions related to the frequency, nature, and scope of their, inter in their contact. Um, and then we also, uh, we'll be having semi-structured interviews with social workers and clients to see the impact on face-to-face -face and the influence on the working relationship. So we finished phase one, and we're now in phase two. So we used a, um, a cross-sectional design. So um, the professional organizations across Canada and the states distributed the um, surveys to uh, p social workers. And uh, to be eligible, they had to be registered or licensed social workers working directly with clients. So we had quite a good uh, response rate. We had over, over 2,500 Canadian participants and 1,200 American participants. We had U of T research approval. The question really was, what is it that we want to answer? What is the nature and scope of informal ICT use among social workers across Canada and the States? So the methods, um, between May and December 2017, we sent it out. There were five sections, participant demogra dem demographics, organizational factors, informal ICT use with clients, boundaries, supervision, and policy. Um, so the results, they're pretty much. 78% of Canadian social workers, and they're almost identical, actually. The Canada and the States are almost identical. And 80% of US social workers use ICTs to inform or informally interact. It's a common thing that they do. And there's tremendous similarities between Canadian and American social workers. Um, so the participant uh, Democrats that under the age of 30 used it less frequently, which is interesting. And um, generally, 
Practitioners with fewer years of practice used it less. Um, the higher level of the education, so if it was an MSW or higher, they were more likely to use it more. And uh, that was in Canada, there was a difference. And ethnicity in the States, that um, indigenous, there was a, a difference in um, how many uh, used it. So white uh, respondents were more likely to use it, and indigenous were least likely to use it. We didn't find that in Canada. People who consider themselves to be psychotherapists, they, they used it the most. Um, and that was across both countries, although in the States there were more who were doing psychotherapy. In terms of the client age groups, um, so working with clients 65 and over were more likely to use it, which is interesting because they might have less access. And uh, um, working in rural or remote remote uh, settings were less likely to use it. And that's an interesting one to look at because is that because they don't have access to it? We weren't sure. And, and again, a change from when we first started, the informal use was um, initiated by both clients and, so, and uh, social workers. So it's different than when we first started, 64% of Canadians and 72% of Americans. And 96% of those who said they will use it said they will continue to use it. So clearly it is the norm. Um, but, um, and only a small pr proportion reported difficulties, um, but less than half of those felt those difficulties were resolved. So even though it's not a large percentage, Difficulties came up. We don't know what they were or how serious they were, and a lot of them did not get uh, resolved. And that's important because you'll see more findings. Um, so the other question that came up were it's related to boundaries. So how often social workers search for client information? So. As you can see, over a third search for client information. And the reasons they gave were additional assessment information, concern about a client, or curiosity. And, but at the same time, they felt that it was not appropriate to, for clients. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Um, at the same time, they, a, a great deal, 34% thought it was not appropriate to search for clients. And very few um, clients were comfortable with, uh, social workers were comfortable with the client searching for them. So they were more comfortable with them searching for clients than for clients searching with them. Now, the reason that's important is because um, the information about us, about social workers, is public, and clients actually do have the right to search for it. So it's public information. And so that's important. In terms of searching for clients, according to the NASW Code of Ethics, we are not allowed, our Americans, but are not allowed to search for clients unless there's consent. So again, these are the kinds of gray areas. And it's also probably one of the reasons why people are not talking about it to supervisors and colleagues, because they feel uncomfortable about it. Um. Um, so approximately half the participants had received a friend request, um, and just over a third declined the request and did not follow up with the client. And the reason that's important, again, is you know we've all learned like if somebody asks you for coffee and how you deal with that, how do we deal with uh, that kind of question um, in a way that doesn't humiliate or doesn't isn't punitive but that meets the boundaries. So. And this is why I think it's important to understand the effect on the working relationship, because if they uh, sent us a friend request and we declined it and then didn't bring it up and talk about it, how did that make them feel? I don't know. I mean, it might not have affected them, might have made them mad, it might have made them feel rejected, but we don't know. Um, so less than half had never interacted outside of schedule hours, but that means over half did. 
over schedule work hours. So then that's important too, because when you think about burnout and, and, and just, again, boundaries. And then very importantly, they did not talk about it with supervisors or, or colleagues. So not even colleagues, which is, which is really concerning. Be, and the reason it's concerning is like with anything, because if they get into trouble, it means that there's nobody they can talk about with. And it means that the message has been given somehow to don't do it, but not come and talk. Um, and just under half identified having a workplace policy. Um, and in Canada, they were, they were aware of the policy if there was one, but in Canada, we're much less aware of the professional association policy, so that's important for us to know, because in the States, they seem to be more aware of it. Not that it seemed to make a difference in how they, you know, whether they followed it. So discussion. Um, so this is the only large-scale international study of, in, of informal ICT use. It's the first in social work. And basically what it's telling us is that um, it's ubiquitous. It is happening. And uh, it's similar across Canada and the States. Um, close to 80% informally use it. So but what that means is it's happening after hours. It, it's it's happening about certain issues. It's happening on uh, these emails about really intense kinds of issues. It's not secure, because those are not secure. It's not private. Um, and among the highest users are the older and more experienced professionals. And it's hard to know. Be, that's one of the reasons we want to have interviews. Is that because they feel they have the experience and they know how to make the judgment? We don't know. We have to find that out. And private practice settings, providing psychotherapy. Just get that. So the changing boundaries. So over 35% of practitioners search for clients online. And as I said, um, that does not meet the criteria. So that's something we could get in trouble for. So it's important to know what the guidelines are. And aside from the ethical getting into trouble, so let's say if, I mean, this is, I think a lot of us believe this, I believe this. Let's say I search for a client online and I get some information about them that I didn't know. But I haven't had consent to do that, so they don't know I know it. By definition, our relationship has now changed because I know something they don't know I know. And um, so again, it might not seem like a big deal. In some cases, it might not be. But just the, 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 the fact of it is important. And approximately one half had received a friend request, and a, a, a certain percentage of those had not dealt with it. Some had actually uh, declined and then spoke about it, but a great percentage had not. So again, that affects the relationship. And it's understandable that they haven't responded to it because I know when, when I first learned about how do you deal if somebody asks you for coffee, it, it's not necessarily a natural response. So that's why we need to be talking about it. So how do you respond in a way that doesn't humiliate and shame, but manages the boundaries? There's greater access to social workers outside. There's no way to hide that. Um, and part of that is they can access us because it's public information. And again, if we haven't had a kind of preparation of how we're going to deal with it, whether we're comfortable. And um, many social workers interact with clients during their own personal hours. And, uh, and again, I, I, we don't know what are the reactions to that and how that builds up. And, and, and I think because it's complex and there's no clear answer for it, that is why we actually need to discuss it. And our, our stance isn't that it's good or bad, but that we just really need to address it. And then we need to teach students about it. And there's less control over information that is shared because information about us can be shared, information about them can be shared. And, and so that's very different because that does... Um, it's in the relationship. So even personal details, like if you respond at one in the morning, they know you responded at one in the morning. You know, it's, it's just personal details that, that we might not think is important. 
So challenges in the working relationship. So again, I've already mentioned this, not following up after clients initiate contact. Um, the fact that social workers are more comfortable with them searching for clients and clients searching for them. And this is an interesting quote. This is by a Gabbard, a psychiatrist. Since information a client obtains through the internet is public, practitioners cannot block certain aspects of their lives from the patients. They just can't. It's public. And they must learn to adapt to the new world that cyberspace has created. Doesn't mean they have to give up boundaries. We're not talking about that, but they must adapt to it. And um, participants were not aware of the NSA, NASW guideline that you have to get consent. Um, and so we also need to be aware of differential access based on immigrant, uh, income, education, whether it's rural, urban, inner city divide, age, immigration status. And the reason that's important is more and more because it's so ubiquitous, people are beginning to think that internet access is like a human right. And so it's important uh, to, for social workers just to be aware of that. And uh, in ICTs, we know it can facilitate services when there's none available. And in Canada, there was no significant uh, difference based on um, ethnicity. Um, and yet, uh, the social work distributed through the Association of Social Workers in Northern Canada, that was less represented. So one of the things we want to do is try to have, get, uh, be able to connect them and, and find out what's happening with them. So in terms of the practice implications, um, so ICTs really facilitate novel, new ways of interacting, and they're complex. And we have to become knowledgeable about it. In terms of policy, uh, social workers are not aware of the policies, and fewer Canadians are aware of the policies. And uh, education, social work educators, we need to include informal as well as formal ICT use in the curriculum. We really do, because it's happening. And students in their placement have that happen, and students when they graduate will have that happen. Um, and we need to contextualize the findings with the complexities of intersectionalities. And um, uh, despite the consistent attention to ethical concerns, um, we need, there's no discussion of supervision. So recognizing that there's a lot of concerns, we need to bring it into the discussion with colleagues and supervisors. And it's got to be brought in a way that doesn't just say, don't do it, especially because it's ubiquitous. People are doing it. Can't go backwards. It's part of the world. Um, so we had some limitations, of course. And um, the conclusions are it's ubiquitous in Canada and the States. Um, both practitioners and clients initiate it. So it's not just clients initiating it anymore. Practitioners do. And they will overwhelmingly continue to use it. They're saying that, no question. And we need more increased attention in helping professions. It's not just a do or don't. Um, social service workers and social workers require knowledge and skills relevant to using ICT in practice to maximize the benefits and minimize the challenges. And again, even though there might be some differences in, in their, the work of social workers and social service workers, both are being affected, and it's absolutely critical. And we need to pay more attention in research, education, and practice. So it's no longer a question of whether social workers and social service workers use it. It's critical to consider the context of the constantly changing digital world and develop practice, education, and policies that address clinical and ethical concerns and benefits. We cannot forget the benefits. Um, and uh, it's absolutely critical. So, thank you. How long was that? It's good. Me? Oh, yeah. So if we have time for questions. Yes. Oh, here. 
I don't want to jump in on Faye's comments, no, but I would, would just say that, um, first of all, the professional practice department um, fields lots of questions about the use of uh, technology in, in social work and social service work practice. The standards of practice can be applied to all of the issues that um, Faye has been talking about, and there are a number of resources on the website related to technology, communication technologies, and uh, various considerations for practice related to ICTs. Any other questions? Yes. You know, we, we didn't, and the reason we didn't, we used to when we first started, um, but I spoke with the privacy person at the University of Toronto, and once cell phones became so pervasive, um, it didn't really seem to make a difference. So they used to really separate it. So for example, the, um, the person who worked for the school board who got the phone call on a Friday night, that was a work cell phone. So, so that becomes the, the, the issue. It's, it's different than it used to be where you'd have, you know, you'd leave work and then you would not be available and you wouldn't check into your computer. But, but with the ubiquity and, it's, and the handheld, that's really changed. So uh, that was based on the advice of the um, privacy. And that seems to be consistent when we ask people. Because again, like I said, that was a work cell phone. Any other comments? So Faye, I know Faye. Yes, you do. <laughs> Faye, I wanted to say thank you very much for going into this research. So for myself, after my experience with ICTs and formal um, contact with clients using a cell phone happened to me in the community doing case, um, intensive case management. And also when I was working with youth in the Jane and Finch community. And I found that mainly I was using it for the purpose of either arranging appointments, changing appointments, or connecting with a client who I hadn't heard from just to follow up to see if that person was okay. The areas that I was concerned about, because now I work in forensics, so I've now eliminated that practice altogether for myself, purposely for the work that I do now, but I realized, like you're saying, that this is something that will be incorporated into our practice and it comes up at some point. So some of the things that I've been challenged with that I didn't see discussed as much here, but I'm curious about it, is um, for social workers, our safety of time, so self-care, and being able to separate work from your home life. I found that that tend to bleed over, there was a lot of bleeding over into my personal life when I was in, engaging in those conversations after the fact, because it would start off as uh, just checking in on the time to yeah. then more serious conversations yeah. would start to come up on text that I didn't feel equipped to handle. And this was happening to me when I was just out of my BSW, so I hadn't even gotten to the master's stage yet, and there was no training provided at the master's level when I was in school at that point. So just wondering your thoughts around this and... Yes, no, I think that's really important. And so in the in this survey, what we found is that's happening. There's a lot of time spent outside of the formal hours. And one of the reasons we wanted to do the interviews is that's where we're going to delve into it more. Because I do think that that's another reason I think that needs to be part of that conversation um, with you know agencies, educators, um, supervisors, colleagues, because it often starts like that. It's that slippery slope. And, and we often talk about self-care, but it's like a, an add-on, and we really have to build that in um, of how to manage that so that we do take care of ourselves. So that's one of, that will be really something we want to find out in the next uh, phase where we will be interviewing. We're going to interview um, social workers, clients, and administrators. Hey, if I can throw one more at you. Sure. So here's another area that I'm curious about as well, is documentation. How do you, how do you now, so technically I can copy and paste the discussions that I've had on my cell phone with a client and transfer that to a note. How do I and should I be documenting? And do I have a conversation with the client? Am I obtaining consent from the client? Is it implicit? 
Those so are, these boundaries are those are all the great really questions, and I think they apply to the college. I think that's where you need to we need to look at that because even if it's informal, it is still in that job. So, um, and and that is people, or it can just be the whole email. But I, I don't think that's been people are not doing that systematically, and which is another reason why we need to be talking about it because it's great that we can contact the college, but we know people don't really do that that often in that way. So we need we need to be actively dealing with that because th that's a great question, and I don't think don't think people have the answer for that. Part of it is to hear, right? So yeah. Why would I want to have? A, I, I might actually want to have a debrief about this, these concerns that come up for me, but then there's this fear of if I do this, am I going to get slapped on the wrist? Well, exactly. Which is why we need to have the conversation. That's why we. That's why the policy needs, is we need to come up to the 21st generation, so that we're not just slapped on the wrist. I mean, for me, it reminds me of when I was uh, clinical director of Integra, and we had a, we ran a camp, and we'd often have MSW students in the camp, or run the camp, and at the or work in the camp. And then at the end of the summer, they would come to us and say, "Oh, I had such a great connection with a student. Can I stay in touch with the students?" I would just say no not realizing, and then when I got to social work, I'd have like true confessions in the class because they'd say, it wasn't about me, but I'm sure it happened with me, that if a, if a supervisor said, no, you can't keep having contact with the client, they, they would still go do it and not tell anybody. So, and then that made me realize that all the times that I had said, no, you can't, I don't know when they did, and they got into trouble, so we can't, it just, it, we have to address that fear because if in fact it is problematic, you need help to sort it out, and we need to have policies without just saying no, because it's like, okay, how do we deal with it, and how do we then make sure we do it in a way that is ethical, that is good, that does take care of ourselves, and when we don't, how do we deal with that? Sure, yes. I did just want to jump in for one moment, because I think in something in your question suggested, you know, you, the questions might kind of go underground, questions about practice. And um, for the college, they're not underground kinds of questions because uh, people do call professional practice with these kinds of questions, and we hear about them in different ways. And for that reason, for many years now since, um, well, I would say about 2011, we've had um, practice notes that address some of these kinds of questions. And um, so there are a couple of alternatives. So what the practice notes do is help, um, they, they're written in a way that they, scenarios in practice um, are addressed and how the standards of practice apply to those various scenarios. So I think where sometimes people get a little bit caught is that they think that uh, technology is a completely separate thing from the rest of practice, but really it's about understanding how the standards of practice apply to the use of uh, technology in practice. And so um, if you haven't uh, been to the college website, looked under the professional practice tab, and looked at some of those resources, I'd really encourage you to do so because they will address a lot of those kinds of questions, specifically documentation, social media, confidentiality, um, competence, all of those kinds of things. And so, yeah. And then it's important that people in your organizations and supervisors and colleagues also do the same because it's got to be part of it. Yes. What about the fact that it's not secure? Well, yes, that's an issue. Yeah. Um, that's why, because it's not secure. And we need to be aware of that. It's not secure in many ways. You know, the email is not secure, and also you you don't know who's looking at it in this person's uh, email or phone. So we have to be aware of that. And I, I don't know the answer, but we have to grapple with that. And I know some people have said, "Well, I've asked my clients gave consent, but I don't know if they really if it's informed consent if they really know what that means." So again, that needs to be addressed. And but again. I, I know some people said, okay, because it's not secure, we'll just say don't do it. Again, that we're beyond that as an option. So we have to address it, and it's not easy. And I think the college's guidelines can really help us. And, and maybe it even means bringing the college in for discussions with agencies and supervisors and colleagues because it's a, it's a thing we need to grapple with. Um, yes? Here I have a, a scenario from my workplace about using like a social media WhatsApp group. Um, 
we do have a quite a number of different uh, support group that we had a running a class, let's say 12 hours training. And after that, most of the participants would like to stay in touch with each other as a group. And um, in the past, we had this experience, some of the um, volunteer from the group, like uh, jumps up saying, you know, I'm going to organize by myself, you know, of this class and whoever, you know, you, you signed up for me, whoever wanted to stay in touch with the group. And then we felt, you know, as an agency, we don't, you know, run this type of the informal kind of technology group. And then after those scenarios, we think, you know, it's like a hijacking the entire group contact, you know, through this kind of like a group experience and dynamic. And so eventually we are taking it back, saying, okay, we are going to assign uh, some of the trained volunteers from this group and then they're going to supervise. And this is going to spell out whoever, when you sign it up, your phone number is going to be public to the rest of the group. And then we are going to reserve this for the purpose of this group. Let's say it's like a woman mental health support group. So we are going to limit the content of this. And what else, the other like a content is not supposed to be um, discuss or like a telemarketing or whatever, you know, um, uh, very controversial issues. So um, after that, we, we had some difficulty, you know, continue to monitoring and administer um, the content of like the forward sometimes, you know, some of the people may think, oh, this is something horrible things and they would just like quickly, you know, Twit it, you know, send it out to the blast group of, of everybody. And then some of the people may, oh, this is like horrible. You know, it really disturbed my sleeping and my psychological, you know, peace. And there are some people, you know, complaining, this shouldn't be like a posting. And then the volunteer, it seems like a stir up a whole lot of the very controversial issue. And we find it very difficult you know, to, to monitor and, and even, you know, with this kind of consent and, and monitoring. So what would be the college advice, you know, on, on doing, like using policy or, or how to, you know, do that as an organization? It sounds to me like your questions are very perfectly suited for me to insert a plug about professional practice consultations, but also presentations to yes. workplaces. So Faye was mentioning the opportunity for professional practice to come out and speak to either the college in general, the role of the college of standards of practice, but also to speak about um, particular issues and the issue of um, applying the standards of practice and uh, to uh, the use of technology, whether that's in um, work with individual clients clients or in a group setting. So rather than trying to answer what sounds like a you know, very thoughtful and complex kind of practice scenario, I'd also direct you to, again, the practice notes because um, some of the things that uh, the, the, a couple of the practice notes address is developing a social media policy. So that can apply for a, an, an individual practitioner in private practice or to somebody facilitating a group at an agency. What are the guidelines and the parameters that you set out in terms of your use of social media or technology at the beginning of your work with a client or clients so that they understand those kinds of parameters, which can help to address some of the questions that you're talking about. So please do take a look at the, at the practice notes for those discussions, and that might be a nice jumping off point to contact uh, the professional practice department, who'd be really happy to speak with you. I think we're almost time. So, I just, and I just want to add to that that, um, and and part of the the change now with technology is that when a group ends like that, then they can continue on social media. But in the past, groups might have continued on their own privately. But if it's part of your agency, then as as uh, Lee said, you need to then look at the policy and how if it's an ongoing group, how do you manage that? Um, but it's, it's a similar kinds of issues, but it just uh, needs to be addressed. And it sounds like you're grappling with it, which I think is great. I think that's it. 
So, um, lots of discussion, and that concludes our breakout session. Uh, I'd like to thank Faye for providing such an insightful presentation uh, in a really innovative area of practice and research that has dramatically impacted social work and social work practice, particularly in relation to the ethical issues that um, uh, are important to consider. I hope you found her presentation both informative and challenging. On behalf of the college, I'd like to present Faye with a small token of our appreciation. Oh, okay. And um, it says hand envelope to speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Faye. Oh, it's always uh, such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you all go, I'd like to remind you all again that you will all receive an email in the next few days with a survey asking you to complete uh, that survey and give us feedback on your experience here at Ahmed. We really do value that input, so please make sure you fill it out. Um, and the email will also contain a link to your certificate of attendance. Thank you all for joining us today at Ahmed 2019, and we really hope that we'll see you again at Ahmed 2020.